Today we are going to talk about Z transform for basically the same reason why we were studying Laplace transform. So Z transform is of course the Laplace transform version for discrete time signals. And the reason for studying Z transform is exactly the same as why we studied Laplace transform. That's because Z transform can be defined for a large class of signals for which Laplace transform cannot be defined. So just to begin our discussion, let's look at the usual signal A raised to N U N. If you look at for A less than one, the Fourier transform of X of N is well defined and it is one over one minus A E raised to minus J omega. <clears throat> That's the Fourier transform for this signal. For A greater than one, Xn is not integrable, which implies Fourier transform of Xn is undefined. Exactly the same story as in Laplace transform. When A is greater than one, the signal X goes to infinity as N goes to infinity because of which uh, we cannot take the Fourier transform because Xn no longer is integrable. So let's try to do this uh, using Laplace transform. So L of Xn, the Laplace transform of Xn is denoted by X of Z, which is summation Xn Z raised to negative N, N goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is the definition of Laplace transform of discrete time signal. Oh, sorry, it's called Z transform. Let me actually write it as Z. Here Z is in the complex plane. Now let me decompose Z as R E raised to J omega. So R is the absolute value of Z. And of course, omega is the angle of Z. So I can decompose any complex number Z as the absolute value of Z times E raised to J multiplied by the angle of Z. Then I can write my X of Z as summation n equals minus infinity to infinity x n r raised to n r raised to minus n e raised to minus j omega n or omega are you saying that's less than or equal to or are you saying that it's equal to the angle of z it's angle of z angle okay yeah, sorry about the confusing notation. So it turns out that Z transform is basically the Laplace transform of Xn multiplied by an exponentially decaying term. Of course, I'm saying decaying because, but R could be even less than one, in which case it's actually an exponentially growing term, but some exponential term 
gets multiplied by x of n and uh, then you take the Fourier transform f of that particular signal. Remember that r is strictly greater than or r is greater than equal to zero. So this is greater than equal to zero. Now, just like Laplace transform, when we define Z transform, we also need to specify the region of convergence. This is the set of all Z for which this uh, Z transform exists. So Z, the region of convergence is the set of Z in this, the complex number such that X of Z exists which is equal to the set of z in the complex number such that summation of x n r raised to minus n is finite. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this concept is clear. This is how we define the Z transform. And then we have to define the region of convergence for the corresponding Z transform. Now, once we transform the signal, original signal Xn into the Z transform, which is a function over a complex number, we need to be able to compute the signal back from the Z transform. So it has to be an invertible transform. So what's the inverse Z transform? Let's look into that. Any questions so far before we jump onto the inverse transform? Okay, so we'll look at this particular equation right now. We'll look at the definition of XZ which is a Fourier transform of Xn r raised to minus n. So let's look into this equation. And we will be able to use the inverse Fourier transform to derive the expression for inverse Z transform. Let me do it in a new page. So I just mentioned that X of Z is the Fourier transform of Xn R raised to minus N, which means Xn R raised to minus N is inverse Fourier transform of X R E raised to J omega. which implies that Xn should be R raised to N. And then what's the inverse Fourier transform one over two pi integral over two pi interval
So this integral is basically inverse Fourier transform, the, the inverse Fourier transform for the discrete time signal. And this R raised to negative N is taken on the other side of the equation and it becomes R raised to N. Okay, so I haven't done anything sophisticated here, just massage the equation a little bit. Let's move on to the next step. One over two pi. So I see that this integral is with respect to omega. It doesn't depend on R. So I can move the equation. I mean, the expression R raised to an inside the integral. So I get two pi R e raised to J omega, R raised to N e raised to J omega N D omega. What else can we do to simplify the expression? I want the entire expression to be written in the form of Z. So I have to do some massaging or do some change of variables. So I have Z equals to R e raised to J omega. R remains a constant, it doesn't vary. Um, I'm just going to pick one R in the region of convergence. <clears throat> omega is the one that varies because I'm taking the integral with respect to D omega. So let's do DZ equals to R J e raised to J omega D omega. So this implies that D omega is one over J Z D Z. Okay. Any question so far with this change of variables formula? So there's another thing we need to be careful about when we are changing the variable, which is uh, the fact that this integral is in a certain interval of omega. So this integral, if you look closely, we have to integrate over any interval two pi in the omega space. So let's look at the complex plane or rather I should say Z plane. This is the real part. This is the imaginary part. And let's say my omega goes from zero to two pi. Okay, so this is my R. This distance is R. And when omega goes from zero to two pi, I'm basically traversing a circle. This is omega equals zero. This is omega equals pi over two. This is omega equals to pi. This is omega equals to, how much is it? Three pi over two. And this is again, omega equals to two pi, which is equal to zero. Well, I shouldn't say two pi equals to zero, but omega equals to two pi is the same point as omega equals to zero. Okay, so We found, we did the change of variables. We went from R e raised to J omega to Z. I found out D omega as a function of DZ. And then I found out that any integral over a two pi interval 
uh, in the omega space is equivalent to the integral in the z space over a unit circle that's going in the anti-clockwise direction. So I'm going to start from omega equals to zero, and I'm going to integrate over the circle all the way until omega until I reach omega equals to two pi. Okay, and because I'm going from zero to two pi, I have to make this integral in a I have to take this integral in a clockwise contour, not an oh, sorry, it, it's an anti-clockwise contour, not a clockwise contour. Okay, so now I have to transform this integral, which was in the omega space to something which is in the Z space. So let's do all this substitution and try to figure out what exactly this integral is going to look like. So I'm just going to write down the same expression, Xn equals to one over two pi integral Xz z raised to n d omega it's z raised to n yeah what should i do now i have one over two pi now this integral is over a circle so i'm going to use this notation so this is integral with a circle and with a circle having an anti-clockwise direction. This is xz, z raised to n, dz over jz. I want to pause here for questions before we simplify it further. Okay, so it seems like everything is perhaps not obvious, but uh, everyone is able to follow the discussion so far. Now let's simplify it further. I can take the J outside. So I have two pi J. I have this anti-clockwise contour integration. I have X Z, Z raised to N minus one D Z. This is the inverse Z transform. This is the inverse Z transform. The most important part of inverse Z transform is this anti-clockwise contour integral uh, of over a circle in the region of convergence. I have a region of convergence of the Z transform. I'm going to pick any circle in that region of convergence. I'm going to do this anti-clockwise contour integral for this function over a complex uh, over the complex number space and then i'll get the signal x and back
Now, of course, in reality, if you were, no, if you were a mathematician, everything, all of this has to make perfect sense. And, uh, and whenever you are given an X of Z, you want to calculate this contour, anti-clockwise contour integral using some of the um, knowledge from your complex analysis class uh, in order to recover the value of Xn. But as an engineer, you don't really have to do this integral. You can always go back and look up, look up the Z transform table to get the inverse Z transform of commonly used signals like impulse signal or step signal and all that. It's very easy and straightforward to do that uh, by just looking up the, the Z transform table. Uh, quick question from the mathematician point of view. Yeah, sure. Uh, in the region of convergence, uh, is that function uh, analytic? Uh, yes, it has to be. In that case, would a contour integral not always be zero? Well, okay. So, so analytic means infinitely differentiable. Oh, it won't be zero because the origin may not be. Oh, okay, gotcha. Of convergence. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Perfect. You know, I took uh, complex integration in 2006. But I'm glad I remember the fact that if you have singularities within the contour, then <laughs> you can't, the integral will be zero. That's right. Wow. I'm glad I remember that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to answer this question. Okay. Now let's look at some examples. Any other question before we move on to examples? Okay, let's look at the first example that we started with a raised to n u of n. A could be any, any complex number, real or complex number. So the Z transform X of Z would be summation N goes from minus infinity to plus infinity Xn z raised to negative n. Okay, so until now I have simplified it. Now I need your help with computation of this infinite sum. And under what conditions would this infinite sum converge? What would this infinite sum be equal to? Come on, someone should be able to answer this question or maybe write it in the chat box. The 
this would ju just be a geometric series? Yeah, so like the geometry. one over one minus uh, A over Z. Right, that's great. And under what conditions would this be convergent? Uh, if the A over Z is less than one, or the absolute value of that is less than one. Right, which means A should be less than Z. So that tells me that for for the exponential signal a raised to n u of n, the z transform is one over one minus a z inverse for all values of z, which is greater the absolute value of z greater than absolute value of a. In contrast, if you remember from Fourier transform class. If A is less than one, then X of E raised to J omega was given by one minus one over A E raised to minus J omega. And yeah, we didn't have to talk about the region of convergence. That's because A was less than one. And the R uh, here is equal to one. So in Fourier transform, R is implicitly one. We don't necessarily specify the value of R, but as you can see here, we are implicitly using the value of R to be equal to one. So that's where Fourier transform is not defined for exponentially growing signal, but Z transform is well-defined because the region of convergence will be uh, smaller in this case, okay. Now let me show you how to denote, how to depict this region of convergence. So this is my region of convergence here. If I have to depict it in the complex plane, then here is how I'm going to show it. This is my Z plane, the real part, the imaginary part. This is my A. or absolute value of A, I'm going to draw a dotted circle. This is my dotted circle. And I know that my absolute value of Z has to be greater than absolute value of A, which means that the region of convergence must be everything outside of this dotted circle. So the dotted circle represents that the circle itself is not part of the region of convergence. Everything outside the circle is part of region of convergence. So when we have to take the contour integral, we have to pick a circle within the region of convergence. And so we'll pick a circle that looks like this in the region of convergence. Okay. All right. So that's example number one. Let's look at example number two. My X of N is minus A raised to N U of minus N minus one. Now this, this signal actually is 
something like for n equals to zero, this is zero. Okay. This is n. The signal looks something like this. So it's defined for all the values of n less than zero, but it's not defined for values of n. Well, it's equal to zero for values of n greater than equal to zero. Okay, so let's look at the Fourier, uh, sorry, the, the Z transform of this particular signal. minus infinity to zero. No, I think I should do minus one. What should I do now? I have this complicated looking infinite sum, which goes from minus infinity to minus one. Any thoughts, how should I compute this summation? So to my mind, only one thing comes that will allow me to compute this summation. So I do see some elements of geometric series here, just like in the previous example, but I know about geometric sum for n goes from zero or one to infinity, but I don't know about geometric sum from minus infinity to minus one. So I somehow need to transform the limits of the summation to, to going from one to infinity. So that requires me to do a change of variables. So let me change from n to minus n prime. If I apply this change of variables, then I have n prime goes from one to infinity. And then I have negative sign can go outside. I don't care. A raised to minus n prime, z raised to n. And I can add one and I can subtract one from here to get one minus summation n prime goes from zero to infinity a raised a raised to negative one z raised to n prime. Okay. I hope everything looks correct so far. Any any question? I think it's correct. Okay, what Could should that I be do? a uh, z to the n prime? Oh, yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah, Z raised to N prime. That's right. Okay. Now, who wants to tell me what this infinite sum looks like?
one over come on someone should be able to solve this infinite sum okay i guess it's uh, the second last week of the semester so i won't blame you for <laughs> forgetting all about geometric sum geometric series uh, okay, so here I have one minus one over one minus a inverse z. And this geometric series converges only when a inverse z is less than one. So I can maybe um, do some. Simplification here, what do I get? One minus A inverse Z minus one over one minus A inverse Z. This is for Z less than A. This is equal to minus A inverse Z over one minus A inverse Z z less than a this is i can divide it by a inverse z in the denominator and i get one minus a z inverse z less than absolute value of a. That's my Fourier series, or Fourier, sorry, z transform of the signal. Let's compare the two Z transform. The one that we just did and the one in the previous example. So actually, let me just write it here. So the first case we did was A raised to N u n and the z transform was one over one minus a z inverse and the region of convergence was z greater than absolute value of a so the expression for the z transform is exactly the same it's just that the region of convergence is different the second one is minus a raised to n u of minus n minus one. And let me write you, let me give you two more Z transforms. So one is B absolute value of B less than one, B raised to absolute value of N. The Z transform of this particular signal after going through some steps is one over one minus BZ inverse minus one over one minus B inverse Z inverse. And the region of convergence is B less than Z less than one over absolute value of B. And then the fourth signal 
b greater than 1 b raised to n there is no z transform because the roc is an empty set Okay. So we see that there are properties of region of convergence that um, even in this case, there are certain properties of region of convergence depending on the signals that we have considered. So in one case, the, so in the first case, the region of convergence is outside of a circle. In the second case, the region of convergence is inside of a circle. In the third case, the region of convergence is a disk in the complex plane. And of course, in the fourth case, there is no region of convergence and therefore there is no Z transform for this particular signal. So a lot of the properties for region of convergence that we studied in the context of Laplace transform, they have similar uh, properties. I mean, there are similar uh, properties of region of convergence in the context of Z transform as well. And we'll cover those properties and its implication on causality of discrete time systems in the next class. Okay. Okay. Now let's talk about the properties of Z transform itself. And as we have mentioned, Z transform is a generalization of Fourier transform for discrete time signals. Therefore, a lot of properties of Fourier transform will be inherited by Z transform. So let's look at some of the properties of Z transform. Any questions so far before I move on to the properties of Z transform? Okay, let's look at properties of Z transform. So I have three signals, X, X, X1 and X, X2, with the corresponding region of convergence R, R1 and R2. The first property is linearity, we all know about. So if you take a sum of signals, then the Z transform will be appropriately will be an appropriate sum of the individual Z transforms with the region of convergence being an intersection of R1 and R2. If you shift the time, um, the Z transform will be multiplied by Z raised to negative N naught and the region of convergence may, may change a little bit depending on uh, whether origin is part of the new region of convergence or not. If you do some scaling in Z domain, then there will be an appropriate change in the original signal itself. And the region of convergence will also change in an appropriate fashion. All of these properties can be readily derived from the expressions and from all the calculations that we have done so far. So I'm not going to go through individual derivations. Much of it follows directly from the derivations of Fourier transform. Okay, the most important property of the Z transform, the convolution in time domain is multiplication in the Z domain. And there should be 
multiplication in z domain which is sorry multiplication in time domain would be convolution in z domain so that part is also satisfied in this case and the region of convergence changes appropriately so at least the region of r1 intersection r2 is what is the region of convergence for the convolved signal then the accumulation which is integrator you can compute the z transform of the signal if you accumulate the signal and then the differentiation in z domain is equivalent to multiplication by n in the time domain another important property of z transform is initial value theorem so if xn equals to 0 for n less than 0 then x0 is the limit z goes to infinity of xz so that's the initial value theorem so xn equals to 0 for n less than 0 then x0 is limit z goes to infinity x of z okay i'm definitely going to provide you with this table for the examination so i don't expect you to remember this table nor do i expect you to remember the appropriate changes in the region of convergence but certainly you should be familiar and comfortable with using this table in your um, homework assignment as well as in the final exam okay there are uh, there are of course multiple tables in this class there is fourier transform table in continuous time fourier transform table in discrete time then laplace transform table in continuous time and then z transform in discrete time so but but I'm sure you all know the drill for using the tables now. Uh, and it becomes very handy for solving several, uh, several questions uh, very easily using simple algebra. Okay. So we are roughly out of, yeah, I mean, we are out of time. So here are the things that we will do in the next class. We will talk about region of convergence. Then we will talk about causality and stability of LTI systems. And then we'll talk about first order system. And then we'll talk about block diagrams. We'll go back to, we talked about block diagrams in maybe lecture four or five. And we'll go back to block diagrams and talk about how this whole idea of Laplace transform and Z transform can allow you to derive the uh, input output characteristics of a bunch of systems uh, string together uh, using the concept of block diagram. We can actually com come up with the input output behavior. So those are the things we'll talk about in the next class. If we don't get to the block diagram case in the next class, then we'll of course talk about it in the Wednesday's class. And next week is of course the final week. Monday we have the quiz four. Uh, Wednesday we might cover some of the topics that we could not cover in Friday's class. And then on Wednesday plus Friday, we'll do a review of the whole area of uh, the whole signals and systems class that we have done so far. Okay, so uh, you must have received an email about SEIs. Please do uh, write your feedback and provide comments about uh, my teaching in the SEIs and I'll definitely take all the comments and criticisms and design my next class accordingly. So thank you guys and see you on Friday. <laughs>